Hi, this is Hugh Herndon with the Teacher Mentor Podcast, and today I'm joined with Amanda Neff, who for 11 years was with Pasco County Schools as a secondary English teacher. She currently is a content specialist for Ancora. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Hi. So I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to talk to you today about um, teacher retention because one of the common themes that I'm trying to establish with the podcast is trying to retain teachers in a profession that um, is fraught with challenges. And many of the challenges are not even something that the system itself can handle. So even if you wanted more of an income or you wanted more control over your curriculum or your class, that's not even something that as an administrator at a site that they could even really give you. And perhaps to some degree, even at a district level, there's constraints that they have, you know, so budgetary or, or what have you. So let's start back with uh, why you got into public education to begin with. Um, and what did you uh, hope to get out of um, teaching high school English? <laughs> uh, yeah, so... I was one of those kids who wanted to be a teacher from early on. Um, it was kind of always what I wanted when I, I remember in middle school, um, I had a teacher who liter who just retired this past weekend. Shout out to Miss Floyd. Um, anyway, she asked us what we wanted to be. And I said, I want to be a teacher. And she said, don't do it. <laughs> and I said, oh, she said, you're too smart for that. I said, oh, but I did it. Um, went right to high school, went right from high school to USF, four years in their program, right out, got a job right away, did all the things. It was always what I wanted. And I loved it. And, um, you know, I originally I wanted to work at a middle school because I'm a weird person, just and I thought high schoolers would be mean, um, which is probably why I taught freshmen for uh, most of my career. Um, but I loved it. I, you know, it was everything that I wanted to make a difference. Um, I love reading. I love, um, I have a background in theater. So it was kind of a combination of those skills. I love writing, all that stuff. I loved working with kids. I loved the idea that I could help mold our future society by, you know, by making an impact. Um, yeah. And, uh, four years in, I won teacher of the year. So I was doing something right. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I felt like I was a really good teacher. I had a lot going for me. I loved my school, um, loved my coworkers, but relatively quickly, I started to catch on that every year was a little bit worse. Things that people would say, oh, it'll get better. Or the thing people always used to say was the pendulum will swing back. The pendulum's swinging this way, but it'll swing back. And I, it never swung back. It only seemed to get worse. Um, so, yeah, uh, I had my son right before COVID. Okay. And, yeah. And so I decided to take that year off. So I, you know to stay with him. Uh, then I went back for a year post COVID mm. and I couldn't do it anymore. I just didn't have it anymore. So then I quit, but yeah, right. getting ahead of myself. Sorry. No, 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 that's fine. I'm, I'm driving it down notes because I wanted to, when you said that you always had the desire to teach, I think when I come across individuals that say, um, they want to teach or they want to go into high school, which has happened more frequently than in years past. And I don't know why. I think there is a a common, I don't know. I think education appeals to those people that like education, right? So if you were somewhat good in school, you like school, mm -hmm. then it would make sense that you would that you would want yeah. to. But I think for some individuals it's um it's a false notion of what work and life is like like as a student they're like oh that must be cool to be a teacher and i said jokingly right but it's it's dangerous because individuals think that they're going to 
go into this system that they're going to go change or they're going to, you know, everyone walks in or not everyone. I walked in thinking it's Dead Poet Society and the reality was oh. it was eight mile, you know. So it's like, oh, okay. Right. So instead of so Byron, maybe that should be Yeah. Instead of Byron should be it's a black question. jacket, you know, like oh, okay. All right. So that's what it is. Right. Yeah. I think so, that should be your question from now on then is what what movie inspired you to become a teacher? Because if you were thinking Dead Poet Society, my movie was Dangerous Minds. Okay, there you go. With Michelle All Pfeiffer. Right. So I went yeah. in with a more realistic view, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that if I buy the candy bars, I can get them to care. Probably. As long as it's not Freedom Riders, I can't stand that movie. Okay. Oh, um, Hillary Spike. <laughs> yes, but she left Patrick Dempsey. I mean, she left I, McDreamy. She left McDreamy for a bunch of students that were eventually going to move on. Does anyone else? He was not, not McDreamy in that movie, though. He was kind <sighs> of a jerk. Okay. All right. But that's we're a whole other podcast. That's a, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> um, coming soon. No. Um, <laughs> so the reason I, 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 I caution students or when students say I want to teach, it's because I don't know what what their mindset is when they make that decision. Like, is it because I want to relive the glory days of my high school, like re-envisioned, you know, as now I'm the teacher and, you know, which is, um, mm. which, which is, is not um, an accurate way to kind of frame education. And I was wondering when you were in yeah. school uh, in college, did, what was the what was the mindset that they put for the College of Ed? Because I was in the College of Ed major. So I, I was, English major, and then I had to do everything as uh, as I was learning to actually teach. So I would go take the oh. alternative certification courses, right? So a year and a half into teaching, right, they're teaching me how to use the grade book now because it didn't really matter how you took the courses. And so I'm like, well, this is well, this is you know this is way before onboarding. And you're like, you know, that probably would have been helpful like in August two years ago, you know? But, yeah. You know. And there's a lot but, of that um, in education. Yeah, there's a lot of that, and so. I, I wonder because I, I, I supervise interns and um, mm -hmm. graduate or undergraduate, and I'm still surprised sometimes about the mentality that they come in and they see students. And I think for a lot of them, they think they're going to, to have, I don't know, like just the quiet, proper little children, you know, like an AP, because that's what they were. And then they come in oh. and they see, they see all of the kids and it's like, Oh my gosh like this is what it's like there's 34 of them i'm like yes you know and and they're like the varying levels of um, capability or you know and everything like this and so I, I wonder for you do you think the college of education i don't know fostered a realistic perspective of what school was like or do you think it was a little bit um um both so a lot to unpack there. Um, I think similar to you don't know what it's like to be a parent until you're a parent, you don't know okay. what it's like to be a teacher until you're a teacher. Um, I do think the College of Ed tries. Um, I went to USF, uh, go Bulls. Um, and things like doing the practicum, the hands-on in-class experience, is always going to be more beneficial than reading a textbook about teaching. Um, yeah. I read, I'm sure you also have read a million different professional development books and all their examples and all their things. The kids sound like perfect little angels from some classroom in Connecticut. And it's just not real. It's not what you face on a day to day because you, it's just a whole other experience to be in there. Um, uh, I think I mean, and as a side as a side note, most of the yeah. secondary ed people, when we get the books, it's always targeted at primary. So the very first book I read in high school was Harry Wong's first day of school. And I'm like, uh, why yeah. am I reading yeah. something? And there were some classroom management principles that are that are accurate, but it's like some of this is just geared for five and six year olds. And I I can't really translate that to a guy who just got paroled and is 18 like that just doesn't really yeah. carry as much I mean, weight and i will say a lot of a lot of people i think are big if you can do classroom management then you can teach anything 
um, proponents, which I think is why his book is so popular is because yeah. it's getting those basic, you need to establish your routines, procedures, whatever, yeah. and then you can do everything else, which has some merit. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, but then when it comes to teaching the actual curriculum, yeah, no, <laughs> there's not, there's not a lot, uh, there's not a lot out there. And I think that, and this is off topic again, but I don't care, but I think that that might be because the idea of teaching in high school is that by the time the kids get to you, it's more of an exploration of content as mm -hmm. opposed to still teaching, you know, we're still teaching, uh, phonics in high school mm -hmm. yeah. and and because there's such deficits early on, we're having to do a lot of, of the same things uh -huh. that they were doing. So I don't know, but, um, well, the state of Florida, the state of Florida, I think is, is requiring now, uh, secondary, uh, English teachers to get a reading certification and, yeah. um, in full disclosure, I, I just said, you know what, I'm going to go in there and try it. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, completely bombed it because it's all, you know, phonics it's all yeah it's like first grade second grade how to teach someone to read and i'm and i'm yeah that's not my wheelhouse like i i assume that you're at least a, a low level reader coming in that you know the alphabet you know how the sounds work you know word um construction to some degree but to be on a test where i have to know how to do that mm -hmm. with a target audience of ninth tenth eleventh or twelfth graders in mind it's it's just like okay this is it's this tough is yeah because they in one hand they're like yeah we need you to be able to do that stuff and it's like yeah i want if i have kids in my class who don't know how to do basic reading i obviously want to be able to help them but then in the next sentence to say also you need them to read the odyssey and shakespeare it's like <laughs> and and five weeks in five weeks in five weeks, <laughs> in five weeks. <laughs> so it's like well i can focus on that <laughs> but then you know there's the other the other side of it so yeah yeah it's it's uh it's tough and i i do think um i think even the general public don't have an understanding of what it's like to teach high school right now um no. what kids know and don't know and what uh deficiencies there are yeah. and what struggles there are because I mean, kids nowadays have access to unlimited information and they can and are experts in certain things. But when it comes to some of the basic stuff, there's a lot of deficits that are hard to overcome. Oh, there's a there's a huge amount of deficits and deficits. Yeah. And I wanna I'm jumping around like you are. I was writing down. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, post COVID because Yeah. I think when I I think when the kids came back after COVID, um, it revealed a lot of structural or institutional uh, challenges that they were dealing with. I mean, mm -hmm. the school systems, I would say nationwide, just were not ready for distance learning at that scale. Yeah. And there are numerous stories um, to support that. But when it came to the student being responsible for their own education in that year, year and a half or two years, depending on where you were at, yeah. they just didn't they just didn't have the desire, the capacity, both, you know, intrinsic, mm -hmm. extrinsic motivation to to do it. And so they come back into the classroom and and the um, and the deficit was just so so severe so stark and I, we're still paying the price of those you know of, of those years that were just lost yeah. and I, I was wondering do you do you think that the post-covid kind of accelerated a lot of the teachers frustration like we understood you were talking about the pendulum i'm sure when you first started teaching your perception of student capacity was like maybe here and then every year it kind of got a little bit a little bit less and maybe it kind of fluctuated within a range but it was it was pretty much yeah. here and by year 11 you know it's it's kind of down here and you're going okay and then covid comes in and now not only is 
the skills there, but there's this will mentality. It's like, I'll just do it online. They're going, you, you're not going to do it online. You're going to go home. You're going to play Fortnite until 2 a.m. because your parents aren't going to tell you to go to bed. And they're going to come in at 6 a.m. and you're going to sleep and you're going to tell me, Mr. Herndon, I'm going to work on it when I get home. And it's just like a vicious cycle of lies. Yeah. And so do you think that post COVID it, it just kind of accelerated the frustration for the teachers, like the burnout, like this, this would have happened like over time, 10, 15 yeah. years maybe, but suddenly it's just like a quantum leap to the like, okay, I'm, 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 uh, I'm out. Yeah. I definitely think it exasperated things. Um, I had my own little like epiphany a little while ago of, you know, it's not just that teaching was hard. It, it was always getting harder. I, I, expect that like you said i probably would have burnt out no matter what but that trauma of covid mm. of being home with a newborn during covid yeah. of all the other things that i went through during that time and then going back to the classroom and having things be so different and so there was a major shift in behavior in attitude yeah. in i mean I, there were, my, I'm a great, I was a great teacher, I feel. Um, <laughs> but in that year, I, I ran out of options on things. Yeah. I'm like, I can't do, I can't teach the way I did because things are so different behavior wise. Um, and yeah, it was too much for me. So I, d I definitely think COVID, um, that whole experience, the mental load of it, the trauma of it yeah. was the tipping point. Um, but I mean, also it, it is such a nice, COVID showed us how resilient we are and how impactful teachers can be. Cause I know we got really creative with some of the things we did in those, yeah last six what, how many months of school was it we had like three months of school that yeah, last came, year yeah. yeah um you mean when we went yeah. into lockdown when we went into lockdown originally yeah we, yeah spring break and then it just it just continued yeah. Would, yeah. yeah yeah i mean everything from what how far we went to get graduation you know the signs and everything like yeah i don't know anyway that was a it was a dark period but it, it was also um I think it really showed parents. Well, I hope it showed parents uh, just how hard our job can be. I just think that they also had a short memory of that and it's already kind of been forgotten. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think there is the, I think a lot of times it's easy to overlook the relational aspect aspect of it that we try mm -hmm. to have with our students. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID was a prime example of that when we were trying to, you're trying to sometimes create a relationship. Like if you were teaching during that year when it was virtual, you're trying to create a relationship digitally, which is not not going to, to, to work. It's not gonna have that same effect. Yeah. So then you have all the behaviors. I wanted to ask you about the behavioral aspect of it because that's one thing that yeah. I, I think sometimes the, the new teachers or the new to the profession or those that are in the program are surprised sometimes is the behavioral um, tendencies of students, regardless of, you know, honors, not honors, AP, or, you know, yeah. kids are kids. And, um, and so I wanted to, to ask you behaviorally, like, what was, what, what did you observe as a behavior um, change shift that was just, that was pressing for you? I've got some thoughts. I just wanted to see what yours are. Yeah. Um, the audacity of certain uh, things has certainly grown. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of, and I'm not, I'm not crazy old. I'm a millennial, but I, I just, I remember even in my early years thinking, oh my God, I would never do that in front of a teacher, or I would never say that in front of a teacher um, from back when I was a student. And, mm -hmm. and basing that on what I experienced, not just in my own behavior, but with other students, they would never have done that. Um, but I think that as, as time has gone on, um, big things that are, that drive, 
I, I, where, <laughs> where to start? Um, big pet peeves of mine, I'll say. Number one is things like um, they'll constantly talk and then you'll say, please stop talking. And then the response is always, I wasn't talking. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things where it's always, I wasn't doing that or this or that. And it becomes this, um, in in the olden days, the back talk. Yeah. They don't talk the, back to me. It's a power struggle. Always, yeah. yeah. And they always have something to say. I think nowadays kids always, and it, on one hand, good for you for sticking up for yourself. But also, I was looking at you. <laughs> I have eyes <laughs> and ears and they work. Um, but it's just a matter of... Uh, when it came to behavior, it became, how do I get this kid to want to pay attention mm -hmm. without letting them walk all over me? Yeah. Because if you're too strict and too harsh, you won't have that rapport. Mm -hmm. You won't have, you won't be able to build that trust where they want to listen to you. Um, on the other hand, if you're just buddy, buddy, hey, call me, you know, call me Miss Miss N, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's not, they're going to walk all over you. You're never going to get anything accomplished. Um, I, for, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, sorry. that's fine. I, no, no, no. I was going to jump in there and say, I think behavior of what I saw was you were talking about uh, the example of the kid that says I wasn't talking. And I think what strikes me as... I don't know, in the last few years, maybe it wasn't at COVID, maybe it was starting to kind of creep before COVID, was a lack of self-accountability. Yeah. Like, it's just, you know, um, there is, that's the one thing that I just, I can't stand when I have to deal with a student's behavior and I address the behavior and I'm, I'm talking to them, you know, privately and, and I'm telling them, this is what I observed here here and here and it's just excuse 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 yeah you know and it could be something as you know um as simple as you know not turning in the assignment you know or um or it could be talking or it could be you know what whatever the behavior is but that's one of those kind of life skills that i think mm -hmm. teachers are held to a different standard in the sense of i could never tell my boss i can't tell my principal yeah i was running late today uh, so what you know it's so it's okay You're yeah. like no 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 you you know well, there was traffic you know right and the response would be okay well we'll cover the class for a few minutes but next time make sure you leave early you know the yeah. next day traffic okay well hugh um set an alarm 15 minutes yeah yeah we're gonna start documenting this right um so it's the accountability piece that i think that we are trying to enforce but we have no real i don't know teeth to enforce it mm -hmm. and and so it's it's this idea that we want to model this behavior because it's going to make you a productive citizen it's going to make you a productive yeah. spouse you know worker or, or whatever but it's it's that it's that lack of i don't know um accountability on on, on their part and i mean I, when you were talking about how you were trying to get them engaged, you know, we're, we're teaching, or I'm teaching in uh, Macbeth now, <clears throat> and um, and Shakespeare. I mean, while I love Shakespeare, it, um, it's not something like I'm going to go put on Netflix like the near, like the latest. You know, and that's that's just not not there. But yeah. I have we read in class the the or I play the audio because. The language goes much faster if it's someone else, right? Yeah. I've got the no fear translations. I have on the digital side, I've got resources for the students that include the audio links, the no fear links, as well as clips to summaries of scenes that we've covered in class. So as they come, they can, you know, they can do it. And yet it's still the expectation when the kid comes in and says, well, I was out, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, it's, it's all there for you. This is now on you. This is ownership of your education. Like I've given you all of the resources. Whereas like when I think you or I in high school, we would have killed to have yeah. the amount of resources that are there. Like if I were to tell a kid like, Hey, you could spark notes this, they would probably go, what is spark notes? Like they just, yeah. they would have no idea. And I even saw this, um, in a class, uh, uh, it's a. It was an AP class, and um, 
they, they encountered a text and they were to read it at home and it was by uh, John Stuart Mill. So like 19th century, it was an essay. So a lot of archaic language by our standards, philosophical topic about happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And it was actually a day that um, I had an intern there and I told the intern before, I said, watch, it's gonna be very awkward because they probably didn't read it and I'm just going to let them stew in silence. And they're like, okay. And sure <laughs> enough, there was like one one or two kids that actually had Googled and figured out like what the essay was about. And I'm like, uh -oh. it's that ownership capacity. It's like, okay, so I read a paragraph. There's only like two or three pages, but I read a paragraph. It wasn't interesting. It was too hard. So I just yeah. gave up. And yeah. and that's the, the accountability piece that I'm trying to, one, as a teacher, say, well, you can't give up always, you know, especially in a test for testing situation. You, you can't just say, I, I give up. I mean, you could, but the results are not going to be positive. But then relationally, as the adult in the room, I'm trying to say, guys, this is the least of the things in life that are really going to create problems for you. Every time that you just want to give up, you can't just give up. Yeah. Yeah, which I think it kind of goes back to like, are we creating a problem mm -hmm. by having so many ways for them to, you know, by having all those supports there for them? Were we able to push through it because we had no other choice but yeah. to do it? Um, I've had that thought so many times of, we scaffold, we break things down, we put them into diagrams, all these digestible ways to get things across. Um, and then when we put them to the to the test, as it were, as if we put them in a situation where they do need to encounter those things, um, are they able to, without our scaffolds, without our everything? Right. Um, yeah, there's a which phrase. Why I think it's, it's good to throw that at them every once in a while, give them something super meaty to chew at and just be like, what do you got? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a phrase called learned helplessness, which I was talking about yeah. in an earlier podcast. And I think, I think we as an institution probably do more damage in this regard by having mm -hmm. what we think are going to be scaffolds or... Mm -hmm ways to um, address any type of learning gap, which there may be some out there, but I think for the majority of students, if we could address the why they aren't motivated and mm -hmm. we could just fix that component, which is yeah. kind of a fuzzy problem, then I think that would that would that would um, take care of a lot of the issues. It would solve a lot of problems. Yeah, I think and um on my lit like as I was <laughs> um getting closer to the end of my career as a teacher, um, I had made a list of things that I think these are what could actually have kept me kind of a thing. Um, and I think in terms of things that need to be fixed about education, the accommodations, the, all of that kind of stuff is a big part of it because, and I know, I'm sure you can speak to this as a teacher who's been in, in an, as long as me but in 10 years 11 years every year i would get more and more 504s more and more ieps more and more um what was the new one there was 504 iep and then there was a new one pmp students yeah. students basically saying this kid has an additional need this kid has an additional need this kid has an additional need and i'm not saying that there are not kids who have those needs of course right. there are but it's gotten to the point and that almost every student has one of those and it becomes literally impossible to meet all of those needs. Um, so it needs to be rethought. It, there needs to be something. I don't have a solution for it necessarily, yeah. but I don't think anyone's really having the conversation of this isn't working having these IEPs, having these 504s, it works before, but now the, so many students, I think, and I think just as a generation, we can all say, 
each of us has a learning disorder. Each of us has an attention disorder. <laughs> each of yeah. us, it's built well, each of us into learns, our society. Each of us learns differently, and 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 yeah. that's that's to be taken into consideration. But yeah, that's um, that's a great point on the on the accommodation piece because for a while I um, I did testing coordination at, at the mm -hmm. school, and the amount of paperwork that would go in for accommodation, like College Board, doesn't just take a district's word for it that this kid has a 504 yeah. or, or an IEP like they require medical you know they wow. require everything the transcripts from the doctor you know to do everything so it's it's not just yeah. as simple as telling college board like hey this kid needs extended time just you know wink wink nod nod just pass them along yeah it's it's very it's very extensive whereas I think with the district yeah. or districts more at the local level I don't know if that burden is really there. I don't know if that burden is, is as much there um, because we're so keen to make sure that they have the safeguards in place. And yeah. I know that there's there's the legality issue, right? I know that they're also making yeah. sure from a, from a federal standpoint that the students' rights are, are protected. But I don't know if those accommodations to what you're saying have created learned helplessness in students and they're not really taking the ownership of their own education they're just kind of letting these accommodations protect them like um you know i've, I've yeah. had many conversations with parents about their uh, iep or 504 uh, over a particular assignment and a standard may address something and they're trying to get the 504 to excuse the assignment because they don't like the assignment and the standard and it's like well, no 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 it's like you're of it. <laughs> your 504 or your IEP doesn't remove a standard like you can't just go into geometry and be like I've got a 504 or IEP I don't need to learn shapes this year like no no <laughs> yeah. no we're going to teach you shapes yeah. and geometry using the methods that work with you but we can't just you know skip over fractions because you don't like it or it's too hard or your brain doesn't work that way it's like yeah you you got it. That's why we're here to figure out how to make it work that way. Um, but yeah, I think, and I do. I feel like, and I can only speak to my own experience. A lot of it had become okay. Well, the parent is saying this is a problem. It's easy enough to fill out this form to say they get additional time. So we'll just do that, and that should solve everything. Um, and that's not the case. <laughs> like. How many, and I, it's not just additional time became way overused, mm -hmm. um, proximity seating. Small I remember group. trying to, trying to make, yeah, small group testing, small group, everything. And it's like yeah. all of these things that I agree help cannot be uh, put into action because our classes are too big. Our teachers are stretched too thin. Our resources, they keep taking resource teachers away when we lost our ESE teachers. Uh, and then it seems like we're on the road to losing ES, uh, ESE teachers. Like it's just, I think it needs to be, I think they need to seriously have a sit down and talk about it and be like, listen, what we're doing worked before but it's not working now it's mm -hmm. not working for the kids and it's not working for the system in general but that's a huge conversation to have because everyone goes oh so we just shouldn't have accommodations no mm -hmm. but we got to address how it's working because it's not yeah so and i think to... like... go ahead no i'm done Oh, okay. I was going to say, I think that's one of the goals of the podcast, too, is to have an honest conversation with what do we want our schools and our kids to graduate with? Like, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the reality is you should have students in a high school, in a district, that unfortunately are not going to graduate. Now, you can work as hard as you can to, to incentivize and to remove the barriers for that mm -hmm. student to be successful. Yeah. But if you're looking at it from a purely data standpoint, out of 1,500 kids, there should be someone that is not graduating, you know. And I was reading an article about great inflation at the Ivy Leagues and how this has trickled up to oh, them. Oh, God, no. Yeah. And they were. I think it was Yale was talking about how, um, I don't know, like 79 to 80% of their students had gotten A's, um, like over and a quarter. And they... 
some of the faculty were feeling pressure from those students that didn't get the A to get the A because the idea was, well, I've worked really hard. I was probably the AP IB kid in high school. I got into an Ivy League school. I've never not earned an A before. I'm not starting now. And so yeah. it, it just has this, this, this idea, okay, well, if we really want the A to have merit, we have to understand the F is the consequence of that. You know, if we really want to have a graduation rate, then we have to assume that there's going to be someone that's just not going to be successful the way that this model is currently structured. And maybe we need to come up with multiple models. Maybe we need to, um, you know, have different paths that are more readily accessible to students. So we redefine success. So maybe success is not, yeah. you know, a graduation and you go to a four-year university and you get $30,000 in debt and, you know, all of this. Like, <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, right? You know, the game of life always set us up for that. Because I was always like, who's going to go to college? You know, the game of life? You ever play that? The board game? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, it's like, who wants to go this extra way and get all this extra debt just so maybe you can get a better job? That's so stupid. And when I was a kid, that was like so dumb. And then I was like, oh, they were warning us. <laughs> Don't do Nelson it. Nelson Bradley, they knew it all along. Nelson Bradley knew. Sponsored by Pearson. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was exactly. It was sponsored by Navient. You're like, oh, my God, it was all along. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think that big picture where we're at seems to be we're getting to a place where maybe we need to rethink the whole thing and grades are not the way to do it maybe well, we need to go to some sort of a pass fail you've achieved this you know, you've achieved this you've achieved this so i i was reading another article on that and they were had a college out west and it the name of forget uh, escapes me but it was a b or c and then after that, it was coded as no C or NC rather, no credit. And and so that way, um, that way it, it would um, it wouldn't report negatively on the on the students' um, grades, but it would be something that that they would tell the kid that they have to take it over, they have to do it over. Yeah, but what's the point? Why? Why do we even have the ABC system? Like, oh, I don't. I don't. Well, this. Uh, I think. I mean, need... honestly, really think about it. Why do we have it? What's the point of having the ABC? Is it be that down to you want? You said this is what you want your podcast to be. The point of education. Why do we put ourselves and our kids into these categories and give them these ratings? What is its purpose? Is the idea of high school, is it to create an Factory ideal workers. citizen? Is it great factory workers? Is, it, is the idea to um, classify students to find out where they should go to meet their best potential? I mean, in an idyllic, idyllic world, that would be mm -hmm. kind of what high school is yeah. for, so that we can pinpoint where their strengths and weaknesses are so that they can become the best version of themselves. How does the ABC system serve that purpose? Because. And that was, and that was Amanda F. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> no. So, um, so Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, do schools kill creativity? Famous mm. TED talk, right? And yeah. I, I read behind his book, but the problem that I have with Robinson is he doesn't really come out with a solution for something as large as like the the U.S. Right? So, like you can do charter schools, you can do these yeah. uh, private schools, right? You can but homeschool. You you can homeschool, you know, but that requires a different socioeconomic status for most yes. people. You know, that requires um, some level of skill or will on the part of the student, right? Some accountability on both the parents and the child at that point, if you're going to be homeschooled or charter There should right? be accountability on the parent, well, though, shouldn't there? Or there should, there should be accountability. Either way. Either way, across the spectrum. You hear, from, saying, you hear from me. Even if you put your kid in public school, you are still responsible for your kid's yes. education and making well, sure yes. they're getting one. Yes. No, what I'm saying, like, even in a charter school, like, yours accountability. So it's just, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, 
what to replace Sorry. the grade system. No, I, I, I don't know what to replace the grade the grade system, but I, I do understand what you're what you're asking. Like what are we getting out of the A? What are we trying to get out of? And that's my and that's my concern with raising a bunch of students that, who I have seen become more grade hungry, grade hungry, yeah. grade hungry, mm -hmm. and they're not and mastery of content. And so um, it's all a, a point. Teacher, it's, a, it's a game. It's a point system. That's all they care about. Yeah. What's going to get most points? There was a teacher I used to work with. Um, I think it was uh, Kelly. Um, and she used mm -hmm. to say um, she would love it if the online grade book went away for a year. Me? I said that. Oh, it was you. <laughs> that was you. That was me. I said that. I said I would love to not have an online grade book anymore because they just yeah. wait to see if the number's going to change. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I, I'm older than you. So you probably had it. But then when I went to high school, oh, okay. When I went to high school, we, we didn't. And there was one, there was one class, Mr. Palmer, and I would have to figure out what I was going to get on the next test to see, you know, if I was going to be able to get a, a passing grade for the class. Because I knew he had 10 quizzes every two weeks on, you know, this material. And I, I had to do the math. And I wasn't good at math, but I, I could at least figure that that part out. But I think that there is a, there's a danger, to your point, and to your, what you're making, about the idea that we are raising kids to get the A, but not the knowledge behind it. And so that just has to trickle up to the Ivy Leagues, to our colleges in general, who want a degree... And I try to tell my students this. I said, but don't you want a doctor that actually understands you that just didn't Google the medicine? I mean, we all can go to a WebMD, you know, and then I'm like, oh, yes. I, have, I have hysterical pregnancy. And then, you know, that's where you want the doctor to go. Well, actually, Mr. Herndon, you don't have hysterical <laughs> pregnancy. You have a cough, you know, like let's, yeah. let's just knock it down to what you actually have. Just because you clicked yeah. something randomly on WebMD doesn't mean you have this. And so... And that's the scary part of trickle down is because it's going to if it happens in the in the in the, in the middle, then the high, then the co regular college and grad school, then that means we're going to have doctors who have been pushed through and who are going to go to do open heart surgery, but didn't really pass the class. And that's terrifying. So we have to yeah, we have to take a step back and be like, are we doing this? I, I understand there's definitely an argument to be made that, you know, kids who are pushed through high school but don't actually have the skills, um, some of them, it doesn't really make a huge difference because no matter how long we kept them there, they were only going to achieve to a certain level. Mm -hmm. I've heard some, you know, I've heard that point yeah. said. Like, what's they're just wasting their time let's get them into the world so that they can work and find all those things. And I know you made the comment um, in the thing with Austin about how the stigma attached to vocational schools and, you know, going straight to work mm -hmm. it, it, that's being eliminated, which is excellent. That's amazing. Um, there are some students who, no matter what we do, high school is not their thing mm -hmm. for them. It's they need to just go out and live in the world. And that's, that's going to be the best way to get them to where they're at. Um, but if we push and push and push all students and this great inflation is the worst of it is if we say, yes, this is an A student. Sure. They've always been an A student. Yeah. Give them an A for everything. A, A, A. And they continue up the track of excellence. Mm -hmm. It, it's going to adversely affect society as a whole. Well, and my husband, also, oh, yeah. I was going to say, my husband is a, a manager and he talks all the time about these kids who come in to apply for jobs, but they don't, they're like, it'll be like, do you have a resume? I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, but it's on you to figure that out. You can't expect your employer to walk you through re making a resume. Like that's yeah. not how, so it trickles into the world. <laughs> when we keep pushing people through but not actually having them meet the standards that they should be meeting yeah no what i was going to say is um the idea that um passing them along or lenient grading like i don't know like the minimum 50 i don't know if that was if you were in that that great you know debacle you oh, yeah. know because um but for those that don't know, it's the idea that if a student does 
not turn the assignment in, that you would give them a 50%, let's say if it's out of 100, that you would give them a 50% um, because they would only need 10% uh, more to then pass. And so 50% is, is closer to passing than if you were to give them a zero, which then the zero to 50 is mathematically in, in, incapable of, of redeeming it. Yeah. But yeah. I did have one teacher that actually brought up a good point, but I'm not asking them to master just 10% of my standards. I'm asking them to measure 60% of my standards. But if I do the 50, then I'm only actually asking them to master 10% of my standards. And I thought that was a good, that was a, that was a good, that was a good comeback to that. It gets, but, um, so, it gets so nuanced, but yeah, there is an argument to say that a zero has a crazy effect in a hundred point score. Like one zero yeah. can make a huge difference average wise. And it is crazy that, you know, an A is a 90 and 80 or whatever. And then there's so much there that's nothing. Yeah. But also there's no, I can think of absolutely no justification for they didn't do it at all. Give them something. <laughs> That's never. Yeah. That should never be the case. Well, I can't think. I can't think of a real world <laughs> example where there is no. Because no you know, despite my my emails to the superintendent, I have yet to have them pay me for not showing up. Yeah, that's you know, rude. I, I, it's just I think yeah. that's unfair. But what <laughs> I what I was going to say about the um, before about that the inflation, but it also I think robs them psychologically of of developing as a person. And so they go into your husband's employment and they think they are prepared and they feel yeah. good about themselves, right? I'm assuming to some degree they've made themselves presentable. They think that they have a chance when they don't have a chance because they don't have the resume, they don't have the skills, and yet we've inflated them to believe that they're at a, a capacity at a stage that they're not. And... Jordan Peterson talks about this, like as parents, we need to be hard on our children to the point where we understand not hard to be mean or mean spirited, but the world won't, won't coddle them. The world won't, yeah. won't, won't look at them like we look at them. And so we have to prepare them for a world where they walk into a manager's office and they're like, I'd like a job. And they go, well, where's your resume? I don't, I don't know how to do this. Like, you know, your husband may respond politely Right, yeah. but there are a lot of individuals who would respond with, "Don't waste my time," and yeah. and immediately that person just their their whole yeah. personality, their whole psychology just takes this tremendous hit. And yeah. we could have prevented that had we just encouraged yeah. them to hold some level of accountability yeah. throughout the experience. And I mean, I'm not the first one to say that failure is the best teacher of all. And when you make a mistake, when you, when it's big and impactful, it resonates and you remember it more, you retain it more. And when we have parents and, and administration or whoever it is saying, Hey, it's not fair that this kid is penalized because blah, 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 blah. Please give them an A or give them a this or whatever it is. It destroys that lesson um i remember one of the one of the biggest projects that in our theater classes we would do is our, our film projects and it's a group project and if you've ever had your students do a group project mm -hmm. you know that it's unending drama mm -hmm. and parents will get upset once grades come out saying oh well this kid did that why does it affect my kid's grade and all that kind of stuff but that in my opinion, is the most important kind mm -hmm. of project that kids need to learn how to do in high school, in the comfort and security and safety net of a high school environment. Because when you get into the real world, you will have to work with other people and other yeah. people will let you down. And you have to learn how to cope with that and how to overcome with that. And you have to decide if I want it to be an A, I need to do more. And no, it's not fair <laughs> yeah. that Jimmy sucks. Um, what have you done to get Jimmy out of your group or to help Jimmy or whatever it might be? Like the, the, the conflicts 
conflict management yeah is a skill that didn't i feel like doesn't get addressed nearly enough because we're so afraid of it because yeah. we would rather not upset parents because we would rather not have you know all this backlash and because it's hard it's hard conversations mm -hmm. um but that is the most meaningful the most meaningful lessons that we can give our kids is that conflict management that okay you failed you failed this test what are we going to do about it instead right. of well here just retake it just retake it just retake right. it it's like no you failed this test so now how are we going to recover because life goes on how do we recover um yeah the the conflict management the conflict resolution i think that mm -hmm. that is invaluable for for people to especially for students to understand that there are consequences too to it yeah. and conflict's not always bad conflict mm -hmm. is not always bad but to your point like i i've had major projects where the student has just actively refused information has been you know presented to the parent as that and at the end of the project then they come back and go well what, what is the alternative assignment and i'm going there is no alternative assignment like i this is something that we've been working on and um yeah i teach a, I teach a class now where they um ap seminar where they have to work in groups mm -hmm. and we spend a lot of time because college board grades them all as a group that's part of their grade as well which many times in high school setting you as the teacher at least i try to as much as possible not do the group grade but do an individual component of the group grade because it just gets mm -hmm. really really fuzzy when kids are not there and how do you hold people accountable when they're not there and you know and to your point you say well jimmy what are we going to do in jimmy's absence you know and then you're in parent teacher conferences because you know my kid's working more because Jimmy's not there and well, I can't hold Jimmy accountable and stuff. Well, College Board is like, no, you all are working as a group. So if someone decides not to pull their weight, then your grade as a whole reflects that. And so we have to work on work on that and, and practice. OK, so what happens when a team member is not there? What happens when you know mm -hmm. you need to hold them accountable? You know, how do you do that? What's the protocol exactly. for, you know, talking it out directly? You know, and it's it's awkward for them to to practice this, mm -hmm. but it's good life skills because we're all going to have that conversation or someone's going to have that conversation with us and they're going to go, Hugh, I told you this was due yesterday. It's not done. So what's the answer yeah and they're not looking for an excuse they're not looking that you know my kid was sick or i ran into traffic they're looking for the resolution that they need which is i'll get it done now and you know i'm sorry there's some accountability i i should have done it yeah yeah we would workshop uh problems it was super fun um again these were theater classes not english but i think that they should be done in english class anyway because they're super fun um but we would workshop things like okay your group you've shown up to film for the day and Josie was supposed to bring the camera and she didn't but you've driven an hour and you're at the beach what do you do yeah because you're supposed to film today and they have to work it out and figure out what would they do oh well why don't we film this on our phones for now oh yeah <laughs> like that's also good problem solving yeah. exactly and they don't because so many of them how many times have you had kids who were like well we were supposed to stay after school to work on a project but then uh so and so didn't show up it's like but two of you were there did did the two of you get anything done well no because the third guy wasn't there it's like yeah problem yeah. solving anyway i'm getting off on tangents but i think no. i think uh, uh, there's something to uh, all of that to the the grading system being not no longer relevant no longer it has no integrity anymore i still get blown away too with the gpas of our of valedictorians being in the 7.0s how does that even happen um it doesn't make any sense to me um which is funny because so most colleges will reduce those honor points those extra points anyway so it goes back yeah to so it's like okay you it's killed yourself and you got a 7.8 it's just they're gonna look at it as a 4.0 so but i mean what what is it gonna take for education to those are and I, i'm sorry because you started this talking about like 
what are the big things that we don't have? <laughs> like, we can't yeah. fix that. Like, that's a huge institutional change to change how oh, the yeah. grade system works and how all those other things. Because if we, well, I think uh, to some degree why we have so many different tests, like every few years there's a new test, it's because we don't want to be accountable with the actual results because yeah. then that would show the system in its deficit. Like, we understand it's it's bad. We have an idea, I think, those that are involved at some level with education, we have an idea of what education the results are. But if mm -hmm. we had one consistent test for like 10 or 15 years, then we'd see all the data and we're like, oh, okay, I, it's really that bad. You know, like I didn't, it's like looking at your budget, you know, like before you go shopping, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, oh, that's that's actually how much I, I have. Okay, well then. Perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll refer. That's honestly as bleak as that is. That's a much more, uh, maybe not optimistic, but a much more like positive viewpoint. My viewpoint of why do we have so much testing is because there's money in it. Oh no, no, no. I, 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 I completely agree on that. But I'm saying if if we had the same yeah. test, I think I think people would be able to see through yeah. the mist and through it. Um, I know we're wrapping up. I just uh, had a couple points yeah. to. Yeah. To, sorry. No, 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 that's fine. Um, another thing about, um, you were talking about um, education and big picture and, and what it would take. And I've said jokingly, but I think it's going to take the collapse of the system itself. And I, I think to some degree we are looking at, I think COVID shook uh, some institutions uh, when they said, let's get rid of the SAT. And that didn't take too long for it to kind of come back into it. But people are... I think there was a New York Post um, article that just came out that said, "Is the SAT even like you know what? What's the relevancy of the of the SAT, right?" And um, and I think it's going to take that because once we have um, a collapse of the of the system or enough of it is is shaken to its core, then people are either going to see the need for it. They're going to see, okay, so I, I don't have the capacity to teach my kids. I can't afford this. Like, I need them to be educated you know, to be productive citizens, you know, this is what separates us from developing nations is a system in place for our children so that they can be, you know, so they can be functioning. Um, but yeah, but it's funny too, to go from, I, I, like I said, I wanted to be a public school teacher. I became a public school teacher. I was a public school teacher. And then it got to the point where not only have I quit teaching, but I don't want my son to go to public schools. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I believe in the idea of public education, but it is, I will not, I don't want my son to be a part of it because yeah. I don't think it's doing what it's supposed to. So yeah, it, it's, to me, it's already broken, but it, it's not broken to the point where the society sees it as broken. And so we can fix it. Yeah. If you had one final piece of advice for those that are going into the profession now that you've you've exited, let's let's trade in on a, on, a, on a somewhat somewhat positive. Although I love the conversation because we have to have these frank yeah. conversations. We have to have honest yeah. conversations. That that's probably why I hate most teaching movies. To be honest with you, mm. is because it is so unrealistic. Because it's one person that. Yeah. And that right circumstance made the change. It could be based on a true story, but not not everyone's Ron and Clark. Not everyone's going to have the the administrative support that um, that you have. And so, to some degree, that's why I like Dead Poet Society because at the very end, what is that happens to the good teacher? He's fired because he rebels, say, yeah. right? Because he he rebels. He pushes against the system because he won't go with their you know their lesson plans, their curriculum, their format, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. And at the end of Dangerous Minds, she was going to quit because it was too hard, but they convinced her to come back because she has a big heart. And she teaches them what, karate or? She teaches them kung fu. Kung fu. That's kung fu. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Because she, she was a Marine. She was I know a lot about that movie. Yeah. Uh <laughs> so what would be your one? What would be your, good Lord, the post editing on this is going to take me forever. Okay. What would be I apologize. your one? What would be the one piece of advice that you have for teachers that are going into the profession? This is hard. Um, I think I'm trying to think of like, if I was, if I could go back in time and talk to myself, yeah. what would I say? 
Um, obviously, I mean, you know, what? I was going to let me caveat this that I also don't think it's it's I think it's okay for people to leave education. Like I don't think it. Like I think um, in like Vietnam and some of the earlier wars, you had like so many points as a soldier you earned, and then you could kind of like rotate out. I wonder if we had that in society where like. Okay, it's like selective service for everyone, you know, like mm. you have to go into public education for like five years and it's like, got to do my duty for America, you know, and then after five years, you know, you get the, you get I the form. I served my you know? time. I served my time. It's like MASH, you know, it's like, I got the form, I'm going home, you know, and everyone's yeah. happy for you. So I don't yeah. think it's bad that, that you leave or that individuals leave education because I think that you can burn out. And I think professionally, personally, There's like you... You know, you can just go. You know what? I, I'm great at this, but I'm 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 I want something more for my life. I, I want. And I, you know I, what's I, funny? Because a big reason why teachers don't leave the classroom is that guilt. Is that I don't want to abandon my kids. I don't want to abandon my coworkers. Mm -hmm. That you know that stigma mm -hmm. attached to quitting. Of course, it's fine that you quit teaching. Hugh, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with quitting your career and finding another one. Um, and they but, will replace you in a second. And they'll, exactly. I mean, you, we think and, in your head that, you know, when you go out, that there's going to be like this slow clap, you know, like oh, no. flags going to be half no. mass. You know, there's going to be a board not, of education meeting to like rename a school. It's like, we already yeah. got you someone, you know, already got your replacement hired. I thought so many, you know, I thought I would be, you know, people, it would, they'd be upset that I quit and they'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe you made that choice, whatever. What I got instead was so many people saying, I'm so happy for you that you made this choice. And that is the right thing. Former students of mine saying, you made such a change in my life. I'm so glad that you're finally getting to do something, you know, getting to have the life you, you deserve to have kind of a thing. Like even they could recognize mm -hmm. <laughs> that this was the positive step for me and not anyway. Um, okay. Back to the advice. You're gonna have to cut all of that out. Um, advice. So, <laughs> um, I don't have the skills for that. It's all going. <laughs> I was going to say, at least I haven't used any foul language yet. Um, <laughs> I don't That's know. That's for the subscribers <laughs> only. <laughs> Here's my Patreon behind um, the paywall. There you go. <laughs> Hey, teacher, teacher, mentor podcast after dark. Um, anyway, I think honestly, what I would say going into it is because if you want to be a teacher, if you're really getting into it and you're going to do it, um, I am assuming, and I know it's not always the case, but assuming that you're in it for the right reasons that you want it because you want to make a difference because you mm -hmm. want to, it, it's a, it's a service that you're providing and it's, it's going to take everything. My advice is remind yourself that it is a job and that mm -hmm. you deserve to treat it as such. Yeah. Everyone says teaching is a calling and I get it. And it takes a certain kind of person to be able to be a teacher, but that doesn't change the fact that it's a job. And yeah. so when we constantly have to remind ourselves not to work off the clock and everything like that, you're going to have to let things slide. You're going to, you're not going to be able to do all the things that you should be able to do because you know, they're right. And you have to be, give yourself grace that you've done what you can. It's never going to be perfect. Make the connections, let them learn one thing. And you will have made a positive impact, but it's a job, and I like yeah, <laughs> I like that. No, that's that's good, and uh, I'll end there because I mean that's one thing that I that I, I told one of my mentors that actually went into education for a while and has left is I would literally take things from her bag and say no, it's a job. Yes. when the job is over, the job's over, and that's okay. that's that's perfect. Don't feel guilty for that. Well, thank you, Amanda, for joining us. Uh, we'd love to have you back. Um, I think we need time. 12 more episodes just to discuss the things we stopped talking about in this one. So, really? sorry. Season two. <laughs> <laughs> so, just kidding, just kidding. All right. <laughs> this is it. All right. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, we will talk to you later. All right. Ooh.